Okay, welcome everyone and welcome back to many of you to the final session of the year of the Leuven Seminar in Classical German Philosophy. We resume again in February. Um, but for now, for our final session, we're very happy to welcome Katarina Kraus and Janis Pieces, uh, who will be responding. So the setup is the following. Katarina will present her talk and then we'll have a short response from Janis and then we'll give Katrina the opportunity to respond to the response. And then we'll open the floor for questions um, from the audience. So if you have a question, just you can use the raise hand um, function in Zoom. You can, if that doesn't work for you, you can type in the chat or raise your hand physically or however you want to do it. But if you try to uh, use the um, if at all possible, raise hand function so I can see the order of um, questions. Um, okay, if I could just also ask people to switch on their cameras, if at all possible, just so we can see each other um, as if we were um, live. Of course, if you can't, um, then that's no problem. Okay, so... Um, our first speaker, or our speaker, is Katrina Kraus. She is assistant professor of philosophy at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, I'll just mention a couple of her publications. So in 2020, she published the book entitled Kant on Self-Knowledge and Self-Formation, The Nature of Inner Experience, and the article from 2019 in Kantian Review entitled The Parity and Disparity Between Inner and Outer Experience in Kant. Today, the title of her talk is Kant's Ideas of Reason, a Contextualist Ex Approach. Okay, the floor is yours, Katrina. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, uh, kind introduction and also for this invitation to uh, the Leuven Seminar in Classical German Philosophy. So before I begin, I just briefly, I take a second to share the screen uh, with you, my screen with you. Um, Great. All right, so I hope you can now see um, my uh, screen uh, uh, with the slides. Yes, Kant's ideas of reason, a contextualist interpretation. Kant's conception of reason with his, its distinctive ideas is a central element of his critical philosophy. Indeed, the element that appears to complete the transcendental project in crucial respects. So ideas of reason are seemingly ubiquitous in his philosophy as they play a role in diverse areas of his philosophy, for example, in his um, theory of knowledge with the idea of systematic unity, in his theory of moral agency with the idea of the highest good, in his theory of life with the idea of natural purposiveness, in his theory of aesthetics with the idea of the sublime, and this picture is probably a, a good illustration of that, and in his theory of political order with the idea of perpetual peace. In all these cases, <clears throat> the general task um, of these ideas seems to be to provide a normative guidance or regulative orientation to a particular human activity, such as the cognition of nature or to make a decision to act. Yet the questions of what exactly for Kant ideas of reasons are and what their legitimate use consists in have remained remarkably unclear. So in this talk, I would like to offer a contextualist interpretation of Kant's ideas. I will argue that the function of ideas of reason is precisely to help us come to terms with our particular uh, contextual situatedness in the world and ideas do so by first presenting us with relative relevant context for our activities and by giving us normative rules for how to proceed within those contexts. So in what follows, I will uh, focus mainly on Kant's ideas of theoretical reason. So the starting point for my considerations is Kant's critique of uh, rational metaphysics. According to this critique, uh, we cannot know things of which we cannot have any sensible intuition, such as our own souls, the world as a whole, or God. So Kant exposes uh, 19th, 18th century rational metaphysics 
as dogmatic because it assumes that we can know something about our souls or God, even though such knowledge, according to Kant, exceeds the limit of our cognitive capacities. So Kant diagnoses that traditional metaphysics um, succumbs to the transcendental illusions he warns us of. Nonetheless, in Kant's own transcendental philosophy, the concepts of the soul, the world whole, and God are reintroduced as so-called ideas of reason, and they are assigned a constructive role in the acquisition and justification of knowledge. Indeed, they have a regulative use with respect to theoretical cognition. But it, it is by no means clear why these ideas, given Kant's critique of metaphysics, can play this constructive role at all. More precisely, how should we understand these ideas such that they can have this regulative use in epistemic respects in the first place. So uh, what I would like to do today uh, is to kind of make a new proposal, offer an interpretation of Kantian ideas that is kind of able to moderate, to navigate between two extreme views, namely between what I call nominalism on the one hand and fictionalism on the other hand. Specifically, I propose a contextualist interpretation and <clears throat> Central to this interpretation is the key notion of a context, which is indeed inspired by contemporary, contemporary analytic theories of context dependency. And I will explain this in the course of this um, lecture. So on my view, uh, Kantian's ideas are understood to denote contexts, that is domains of realities or worlds in some generic sense, rather than objects or things. So their use consists primarily in mapping and demarcating the context within which a certain mental activity can first be meaningful or intelligible for us. What I will do in the following is first, again, focusing in particular on theoretical ideas, spell out a little bit more what its regulative use consists in and what the two inter extreme interpretations look like and what their problems are. Then I um, look more closely into the function of reason uh, and into Kant's visual metaphors, in particular, the metaphor of a horizon. And then in this, the third part, spell out <clears throat> uh, my contextualist interpretation, argue why I think a contextualist interpretation is, is the best way to understand Kant's ideas. And then I close with a brief conclusion and an outlook. So, Kant's ideas of reason. What are they at all? So in the critique um, of your reason, he offers us uh, a first definition of so-called transcendental ideas, die in der Vernunft. A transcendental idea is defined as a necessary concept of reason to which no congruent object can be given in the senses. So that is, it's a concept uh, to which we can never have a corresponding sensible intuition, and therefore it necessarily goes beyond our possible experience. And so ideas of reason can never serve uh, to determine objects of cognition, for cognition requires, according to the results of the transcendental analytic, the interplay of concepts and intuitions. But Kant then shows uh, in a detailed analysis why our reason uh, nonetheless naturally forms these concepts. Reason as the faculty to infer has the essential task of searching for more and more general conditions of a given experience. So through this natural tendency to seek completeness of conditions, reason ascends to more and more general con uh, conditions until it reaches the totality of conditions and hence, something unconditioned. So reason becomes the source then of its own ideas or concepts. And these uh, ideas are understood primarily as concepts of a totality or a whole. So he says th things like um, an idea is the concept of the totality of conditions to a given condition thing. It's the concept of an absolute whole or the concept of the whole of all appearance. Now, um, let, me, let us look into uh, some examples here. So the three traditional examples are the idea of the soul, the world whole, and God. So uh, the idea of the soul, for instance, is gained through an iterative inferential procedure that starts from a given representation or mental state, 
seeks the unconditioned in a, sub, uh, in a subject and then denotes the sum total of all inner appearances or inner mental states uh, and is, uh, is um, understood as the concept of the absolute subject as the absolute unity of the thinking subject. Now, uh, similarly, he gives definition and infer uh, inferential procedures um, by which we can derive the idea of the world whole. It's the sum total of all appearances, uh, and it's finally identified as the concept of, of the absolute unity um, of a series of conditions of an intuition. So here, think in particular about, for instance, a causal, uh, the whole causal series of a given thing that I, of my cup of coffee that I encounter right now. And then finally, the idea of God uh, concerns the possibility, not of all appearances, but of all possibility. And so it's the concept of the ens realissimum, um, the most real being. Of course, note here that he works with these three ideas because they also have been the traditional objects uh, of metaphysics. But now the question is, um, what legitimate use could these ideas still have? And in particular, what use could they have with respect to theoretical cognition of nature with which I'm concerned here? So generally, he gives an answer to these questions by saying, well, ideas of reason have an excellent and indispensably necessary regulative use, namely, that of directing the understanding to a certain goal. What this goal is, is still quite uncontroversial. It's a kind of systematic unity. So Kant goes on to argue that reason seeks um, to bring about the systematic in cognition, that is to bring empirical cognition into a system of interconnected uh, or in an interconnected system in accordance with necessary laws. But still, we can ask what exactly uh, does such a regulative use consist in and what pre is precisely the role of ideas in this regulative use? So let me give, me an ex give you an example uh, with which I've worked in um, my recent book, uh, which Pavel has just mentioned, Kant on Self-Knowledge and Self-Formation. So here, um, with regard to the idea of the soul, the regulative use uh, is with respect to what Kant calls inner appearances. We could roughly translate this as mental states. And so the regulative use aims at a systematization or at the systematic unity of all my inner mental states. How do I achieve this? Well, in an interesting passage that has been very crucial for my interpretation, he um, explains this as follows. Uh, it, it consists in considering myself as if my mind were a simple substance that with personal identity uh, persistently exists at least in life while its states are continuously changing. So what is striking in this quotation is the hypothetical nature of the statement implied by the phrase as if. So, and there is a dispute about what exactly that as if claim comes down to. And two main lines of interpretation have eventually emerged uh, to which I now turn. And um, we should think about these two interpretations maybe as the two extremes on a spectrum. So let me um, briefly introduce them and also say what I find problematic about these interpretations. First, the noumenal interpretation. Um, a possible reading, um, could be characterized by the following two theses. First of all, ideas of reason are taken to refer to real things in themselves, or what Kant would call noumena as the objects of reason. The regulative use um, of ideas then involves a certain kind of ontological commitment, namely to the existence of such real things, although there cannot be any cognition or knowledge in the proper sense of these things, since we lack the corresponding sensible intuitions. Nonetheless, uh, this ontological commitment is, is important because it's supposed to guarantee that our efforts in systematizing our empirical cognitions are at all legitimate and will eventually be successful. That is, will indeed lead to a complete and systematic cognition of the whole of nature. Here's the problem I see, I see with this view. 
On this reading, the regulative use uh, seems to presuppose an absolute use of ideas and thus again leads to the objectification or as Kant calls it, hypostatization of the ideas. So we again turn them into objects and this is, uh, interpretation ultimately succumbs to the transcendental fallacies that Kant warns us of in his critique of metaphysics. So another um, um, interpretation has emerged um, to deal with these problems. Uh, according to the fictional interpretation, ideas are understood merely as heuristic fictions, as the mere products of human reason without reference to actually existing things, to real things. Uh, nonetheless, uh, their regulative use consists in the formation of hypotheses about possible beings but these hypotheses can very well be empty, that is, without reference or simply false. Um, nevertheless, from these hypotheses, we can derive meth methods for the systematization of our cognitions, and therefore they are heuristically useful. So in an extreme version of fictionalism, this interpretation involves also an ontological commitment, namely to the non-existence of falsity of what these fictions describe. Now, the problem I see with this interpretation is that potentially or actually false fictions are used to regulate the formation of positive content and to justify the legitimate norms through which we gain knowledge. This raises the deep question about the legitimacy, legitimacy and objective validity of these fictions in the first place. Why should um, the mere constructs of our minds play a normative role in grasping a mind-independent reality? So um, let me briefly explain um, more broadly why I think these two interpretive tendencies seem problematic to me. We can ask more specifically, um, in what sense can ideas re of reason refer to something real at all or describe a reality at all? And is the regulative use of ideas really a real use of reason? It is often assumed that the real use of reason concerns either something empirically real, so for instance, uh, objects of possible experience, but such use is certainly conditioned by the sensible conditions of human cognition and existential commitments must be based on sensible intuition, which is not the case for ideas of reason. The other way we can understand a real use is by understanding it with regard to something transcendentally real, for instance, things in themselves that are assumed to be mind independent. Such use is unconditioned or absolute, but that also means that it transcends the limits of experience and existential commitments are, are therefore unprovable or at least highly questionable. So the reason that both interpretations are problematic is in my view that both take the ideas to be object concepts. That is concepts referring to objects in some sense, either to real noumenal beings or to merely imaginary fictional beings. So the regulative use then it involves descriptive claims about some underlying reality that can either be false, taken to be false or taken to be true. Um, but what I would like to suggest instead is in opposition to these two interpretations, that there is another option for the real use of ideas, namely the use with re uh, respect to contexts rather than objects or things. So let me just briefly outline the contextualist interpretation that I will, um, that I'm going to argue for. So I will firstly argue that ideas should be understood to to denote not objects or things in some sense, but contexts that is domains of reality or worlds in a generic sense. Their legitimate use uh, then consists in identifying and presenting the contexts in which certain, a certain kind of mental activity can be meaningful for subjects like us. And let me tell you more specifically what I think the regulative use of theoretical ideas is it generates those contexts within which our experience can first be understood as sufficiently determined and truth apt theoretical cognition of sensible objects. 
There's a lot packed into this, in particular, the notions of sufficiently determined and true theft, which I'm trying to unpack in the rest of this talk. So, um, before I develop uh, this interpretation further, also in light of context dependency and analytic philosophy of, of language, I would like to um, introduce further um, uh, further background on the relation between reason and understanding, and in particular on Kant's visual metaphors of, of the horizon. All right. Um, let us look more closely at the case of theoretical cognition of nature um, and at the specific interactions between the different faculties of cognition. Classically, um, Kant introduces the two major faculties of cognition, sensibility and the understanding. While sensibility delivers sensible intuitions as direct representations of particulars, such as, for instance, this particular rose, the understanding is the capacity to judge and hence to produce judgments, for instance, of the following kind, the rose is red. Kant spends many pages in the critique of pure reason to explain how exactly the interaction between sensibility and the understanding works and how we can guarantee that the concepts and judgments of the understanding indeed fit for the, uh, for the intuitions that are received through the senses. And I know that here in the audience, um, several people have done really uh, incredible work on, on exactly this relationship. So uh, the story very roughly is that the understanding determines rules for the sensible synthesis of the imagination, such uh, that um, the way in which we unify a sensory input or sensory, the sensory manifold fits indeed um, um, the concepts of the understanding. And so uh, that in the end, the categories of the understanding are determine indeed generic properties of objects of experience. But um, now the obvious question might be, uh, what then might be the function of reason in this story? Kant writes the understanding constitutes the object of reason just as sensibility does for the understanding. So reason is said to regulate the actions of the understanding, that is to prescribe uh, rules, not uh, to the actions of the imagination, but to the very actions of the understanding. And reason is therefore understood as the faculty of the unity of rules of the understanding. But what could that possibly mean? Let us look more closely into the interaction between the understanding and reason. Uh, so, the task uh, of reason is primarily a procedural one. The task of reason is only to indicate the procedure in accordance with which the understanding can be brought into thoroughgoing agreement with itself. So uh, reason um, defines rules by which the use of the understanding should proceed. So if we go back to our example, uh, the judgment that the rose is red, we can ask ourselves um, in which sense the understanding needs assistance here. We can, for instance, ask, is the judgment true? Is the object uh, I cognize really a rose? Is the rose I mean really red, et cetera? So this question or this set of question aims at the truth value of the judgment and indeed reason has an epistemic function. It helps us to find epistemic reasons uh, for which we take a certain judgment to be true. And Kant argues that we need a system of inferentially connected cognition so that we can test the truth of a certain hypothesis or cognition. But uh, this epistemic function I submit is preceded by another function or question, namely by questions such as, oh, uh, sorry, such as, um, what do the concepts rose and red mean? Can color concepts be meaningfully applied at all to objects that fall under the concept rose or any other flower concept? So here we are concerned with the determination of the semantic content of concepts and judgments. And it is uh, on this semantic function of reason that I will focus in what follows. <clears throat> 
And it will become clear that uh, questions about the semantic meaning of experience and cognition can also only be, be um, re uh, answered in a relative sense, namely relative to a certain conceptual system. Now, uh, why is the semantic function of reason so important? Well, because without, cogn without uh, it, cognition remains severely underdetermined. The understanding with its a priori concepts uh, provides only formal conditions for how to determine sensible intuitions, but it lacks material conditions for fixing the precise consent of concepts and judgments. So just very, very briefly to give you an overview, there are different levels or kinds of underdetermination that the understanding faces. Obviously, there is an under, there is a cert, certain kind of indexical uh, underdetermination. So uh, we as cognizers have a distinctive um, spatial temporal standpoint in the world from which we um, first of all, uh, obtain our sensible intuitions that then uh, are taken to correspond to certain judgments and cognitions. So this underdetermination is, is kind of fixed by sensibility. But more importantly, for the semantic determination of cognition is the certain kind of rel relationality of empirical concepts. So Kant writes that there is an indeterminacy of the logical sphere in regard to a possible division into species concepts and genus concepts. So to understand what a judgment means, uh, one needs to understand the empirical concepts therein employed. So in order to understand what the judgment the rose is red means, we need to understand concepts such as rose, need to understand how it relates to other flower concepts, to uh, higher genus concepts, to more spe specific species concepts. The same for the concept red. So um, this is one sense in which reason will be particularly um, relevant. Then secondly, and related to this point is that um, we have like that there are certain entailment relations that hold between empirical cognitions. And in a way, Kant argues that, of course, we can never know all these uh, entailment relations, but we need to have a sufficient grasp of some of them, or at least to be able to, to um, un uh, further infer a certain amount of um, entailment relations that follow from a particular empirical intuition, cognition, and this is what he calls uh, have sufficient determination for a certain purpose. This will be the second um, um, task that uh, reason has to fulfill. Now, before we, before I um, argue more specifically for the contextualist interpretation, I'd like to introduce uh, Kant's visual metaphors by which he tries metaphorically to explain this function of reason. And he talks in particular, or he uses in particular, uh, the visual metaphors of a standpoint, a field of view and a horizon. So he says things like the following, um, reason prepares the field for the understanding, the field of possible experience, the field of view. Or one posits an idea of reason only as a unique standpoint from which one can access a certain systematic unity. So these metaphors indicate this perspectival and relational nature of cognition. Uh, I'd like to read out to you one remarkable passage in which Kant introduces the notion of a logical horizon. Let me read it out slowly to you. Systematic unity can be made palpable in the following way. One can regard um, every cons uh, one can regard um, every concept as a point which, as the standpoint of an observer, has hit its horizon that is a multiplicity of things that can be represented and surveyed as it were from it. Within this horizon, a multiplicity of points must be able to be given to infinity, each of which in turn has its narrower field of view, that is every species contains subspecies and 
smaller and smaller horizons. And every logical horizon consists only of smaller horizons, subspecies. But different horizons, different genera, which are determined from just as many concepts, one can think as drawn out into a common horizon, which one can survey collectively from its middle point, which is the higher genus, until, and this is the important part of it, until finally the highest genus is the universal and true horizon determined from the standpoint of the highest concepts and comprehending all manifoldness, as genera, species, and subspecies under itself. Now, let me um, explicate this uh, logical metaphor uh, or this visual metaphor of the horizon a little bit further. We could first think of a visual horizon and understand the metaphor literally. Think of an, uh, an observer standing um, at this red dot here and looking um, to the right-hand side. So we can visualize the observer's visual horizon with the help of this visual cone. Imagine, um, so the cone illustrates the observer's field of view and everything contained within that field of view can be seen by the observer. Then this line marks the horizon of the observer's point of view that it, it, it demarcates between what can be seen from the standpoint and what cannot be seen from the standpoint. Now Kant seems to think that a logical horizon functions in a similar way. So we can understand using a particular concept, for instance, the concept of a rose in our judgment, the rose is red, as a particular logical horizon, which spans a, a particular logical sphere or extension, which are all the objects that fall under this concept. And with our principles of generalization and specification, we can move up to higher, uh, more broader horizons or to smaller, more narrower horizons. For instance, we can move to the broader horizon of the concept of the plant, under which not only the concept of the rose, but the concept of the tulip and the orchid and so on are also um, contained. Now, in the very end of the passage I just read out, he comes, uh, he moves to the highest genus concept, and with this, the most general. Uh, and the commonly shared horizon that is opened by a highest genus concept. So we have a logical standpoint. In our example, it could, for instance, be the standpoint um, that is opened by the concept organism or living being. It encompasses the whole realm, re realm or sphere of living beings. And the highest concept of the conceptual system it spans is the largest possible, the most general horizon and contains all further dependent concepts under it. So uh, contained in this conceptual system is uh, the whole of all more specific sub concepts that can apply to living beings. Now, um, with this, um, brief explication of the visual metaphor, let us go back to um, the, the task of reason and in particular the regulative use of the, under, of the ideas of reason. So what results from this for our problem with our experience of the rose and the cognitive judgment, the rose is red, is the following. In order to sufficiently determine the the uh, content of the cognition, we must base our experience on an adequate conceptual system. In order to understand and correctly classify our experience of the rose, we have to ask ourselves under which highest generic concept it could fall. So a highest generic concept could, for instance, be material body, which um, determines the conceptual systems of physical concepts. It could also be the the um, generic, the genus concept organism, as I explained in the example, it could have been maybe uh, the genus concept of a psychological person, which spans the system of psychological concepts, but which seems less adequate for the experience of the rose. So under which conceptual system I reflect my experience determines what kind of cognition it is, for me and what kind of cognition I understand a given experience to be. So conversely, only when I've chosen an adequate conceptual system can I make sense of my experience um, 
as a particular kind of cognition um, pertaining to a particular kind of object. From these examples of most general genus concepts, it now becomes clear that our ideas of reason play a central role. Each um, of these proposed uh, genus concepts is based on an idea which makes this concept possible in the first place. And the relevant ideas in my example would be the idea of the world whole, primarily here understood as a causally coherent um, absolute physical space, the idea of a natural purpose that gives us gives rise to the concept of an organism, or the idea of the soul that gives rise to the psychological, the concept of the psychological person, as I've argued elsewhere. So now we can give a pre preliminary story about our ideas of reason in the following way. Ideas of reason have um, serve as the most general concepts of reflection and span corresponding conceptual systems. The representational content of an empirical cognition is sufficiently semantically determined only in relation to an adequate conceptual system. And if all goes well and our systematization is adequate, then ideas identify and present irreducible domains of empirical reality. And that's exactly what I would like to call a horizon of the understanding or context of intelligibility in which experience is first intelligible as a specific determinate cognition of an object of a certain kind. All right, so now um, I go back and give a few more details about how this um, interpretation works. And um, let me just uh, go back to the brief um, summary of the contextualist interpretation I've, I've presented earlier. So my main thesis is first that ideas are understood to denote not objects or things, I've argued against that in the first part of the, the talk, but as concepts. And those concepts, very broadly, I identify with what, what, with what Kant calls a horizon. So a domain of reality or world in a generic sense. And their regulative use consists precisely in generating those concepts or presenting to the mind those concepts within which our experience can be understood as sufficiently determined and eventually truth apt theoretical cognition of sensible objects of a certain kind. Now, um, in order to argue in more detail for this interpretation, I draw on uh, uh, some crucial insights from analytic philosophy of language, namely on the idea that semantic meaning and truth values are context uh, dependent. Um, let me just ask this question, for how much longer can I talk? Uh, it's up to you. Um, how much? How much longer do you have till the end? I could just summarize the results very briefly um, about this analytic approach, and then maybe go more to the outline and come back to Kant. Okay, thank you. Um, so very briefly, the idea is that we can um, first of all uh, distinguish between two different kinds uh, of context dependencies. First of all semantic contents uh, of expressions are said to depend on their context of use and truth well use of, of statements depend on the context of their evaluation or circumstances of evaluation. Uh, primarily we get examples like indexicals like I here now and or temporal expressions like yesterday or in 10 years. And I just want to introduce because what I there there are lots of dissimilarities between the contemporary context uh, or the contemporary theories too, but I, I just want um, this distinction between two kinds of context dependencies. So let me give you an example. First of all, if I take the utterance in thirty years, I will experience the effects of climate change. Then this utterance has a, a particular context of use. For instance, the speaker let's call it KK, says on December 16, 2021, well, in 30 years, I will experience the effects of climate change. What I actually say, or what the content of my utterance then is, is the speaker KK experiences the effects of climate change in 2051. So we have determined all the indexical elements in this uh, utterance um, at a certain context of use. 
And um, similarly, uh, we can now ask uh, whether this utterance made today by the speaker KK is indeed true. This depends uh, on the context of evaluation. So the expressed proposition is true if and only if it is true in the relevant world we look at, and let's just look at the, at the actual world. So the, uh, the, the utterance is indeed true if and only if the speaker KK does indeed experience the effects of climate change in 2051. That obviously depends on whether the effects of climate change will come about by then uh, and whether uh, KK is still around to experience them. So we have two kinds of uh, context dependency, which we can um, uh, call semantic context dependency, the dependency of the semantic meaning of a sentence on the context in which it is uttered. Um, so here the context of use plays a content determinative role with respect to semantic meaning. And we can uh, speak of epistemic context dependency, the dependency of the epistemic value of a belief uh, on the context in which it is evaluated. And that's the context of evaluation. And since I have been focusing on the semantic uh, role of reason, I will also focus here on the semantic context dependency in the first place. Now the question is, um, with this distinction, can we make sense of this distinction uh, with respect to Kantian cognition. And of course, this is a move that is not uncontroversial because I was just talking about items of language and now I go back to Kant and talks about, talk about items of the mind or mental items. So nonetheless, I would like to suggest the following way to apply this idea of context dependency. So experience, we could say, we could understand as a particular subject's mental state at a time t, with a representational content concerning an object. So it kind of uh, is, is, uh, is, corresponds to an utterance. Cognition it could then be understood as the objective representational content that this experience has. It could be roughly the propositional content of an utterance. Now, in uh, the previous um, section, I've talked about the relational nature of cognition that must be fixed. And we could now understand this, uh, that this must be determined with respect to a particular context. And again, we could think of two contexts here, a context, let, it, let us call it a context of apprehension and intelligibility as the context in which an experience is indeed apprehended and then understood by a subject that roughly corresponds to the context of views I've just introduced and a context of evaluation as the context in which the objective content of a cognition is assessed with regard to its truth value, um, which corresponds to the context um, of evaluation. So now let me go equipped with this fine-grained terminology. Let me go through the three claims I have made after the analysis of the horizon metaphor and see whether we now can make sense um, of the contextualist interpretation. So the first claim I made was the following. Ideas of reason uh, serve as the most general concepts of reflection and span corresponding conceptual systems. So note here that ideas of reason do not fix like the indexical underdetermination of cognition, as it was in the case of philosophy of language, but it fixes, as it were, the conceptual underdetermination under of cognition. Uh, and um, so, indeed, Kant writes, says the following about uh, ideas. An idea, one cannot properly say that an idea is the concept of an object, but it is only the concept of the thoroughgoing unity of these concepts, of these object concepts. And I take that these, uh, this particular quotation, for instance, um, indicates that we should understand ideas not as referring to particular objects or things, but as spanning uh, conceptual systems. Um, and why is this uh, indeed important for the determining um, determination of cognition? Well, secondly, I, I suggested that the representational content of an, an empirical cognition is sufficiently semantically determined only in relation to a conceptual system. 
and um, Kant explicitly assigns to ideas of reason a determinative or better determination enabling function that can be understood along the lines of the content determining role uh, of contexts of use. So he, for instance, writes the following. So ideas present those contexts in which a cognition will be fully determined. So he writes, transcendental ideas will determine the use of the understanding in the whole of an entire experience. And um, the pure concepts of reason consider all experiential cognition as determined through an absolute totality of conditions. Note again, this considering as if or considering in a particular way recalls the hypothetical formulation that we typically find with ideas of reason. So these uh, quotations seems to indicate the determination enabling function of reason by presenting a whole of an entire experience, a whole and totality of conditions within which, if it were given fully, within which um, the cognition would be fully determined. But note that an, an idea is only the a priori outline of such a context. The context itself needs to be filled by empirical data and cognition, and it, it is, in fact, never completely given. Now, um, finally, I said um, ideas identify and present irreducible domains of empirical reality. So here, finally, if our systematization of cognitions is successful, then this system of cognition captures the real entailment relations within a certain domain of reality. So it maps onto a certain domain of reality and hence the idea demarcates a certain domain of, uh, of reality in which these entailment relations are instantiated. So here, for instance, Kant says the following, this systematic unity of reason always presupposes an idea, namely that of the form of a whole of cognition, which precedes the determinate cognition of the parts and contains the conditions for determining a priori the place of each part in, and its relation to each other. So the idea seems to be that uh, reason complements the determining function of the understanding. The regulative use on a, of an idea can now be understood as an a priori presentation of a domain of possible experience in relation to which the understanding can first uh, properly operate, namely operate in a coherent, intrinsically coherent matter and then uh, proceed to its actual goal, namely to the sufficient determination of cognition of a certain kind. Again, the idea defines only the general a priori form of the system. The system itself is subject to an empirical infinite process of revision and extension. So this is, um, once we get to the domain of empirical reality that maps or that is, uh, is uh, supposed to correspond to an idea. This is what I would like to call the context of intelligibility in which experience is intelligible as sufficiently determined cognition. Now, uh, very briefly at the end, I, I'd, I'd like to point out that there is a normative um, uh, function behind uh, or included in this contextualist reading. You remember that um, the regulative use consists in directing the understanding towards a goal, namely towards the goal of systematicity or an inherently coherent use of the understanding. And now once the goal is mapped out by an idea, we can now derive normative rules for the use of the understanding within that context. And it is in this sense that Kant also argues that ideas serve the understanding as a rule as soon as the context within which the understanding should seek co a coherent use is mapped out. For instance, again, going back to my example of the soul, uh, I've, I've argued elsewhere that the idea of the soul provides exactly those normative rules uh, through which inner experience can be understood as, as cognition of my own mental states or psychological properties, and then gives normative rules for how I acquire self-knowledge in the first place. Finally, um, without the prerequisite of a suitable adequate context of the understanding, our, um, our context of intelligibility, 
our sensory experience remains rhapsodic, scattered, and ultimately incomprehensible and not intersubjectively uh, communicable. Now, uh, I've indicated earlier an epistemic function of reason, and I just would like to take uh, one more minute to, to, to cash out how that epistemic function um, is also served by ideas of reason. So the ultimate goal of the understanding and reason in its theoretical use is truth and knowledge. And reason is understood to provide touchstones of truth or sufficient marks of truth. And now there is within the contextualist interpretation, the natural question, well, what is then the relevant context of evaluation? So far, I've only talked about contexts of intelligibility, of use, of apprehension. And there is indeed a problem. We cannot just take any context of intelligibility um, to plug in as a context of evaluation because a context of intelligibility after all might be time sensitive and subject to infinite revision and extension. So, um, so here the problem is, um, so I want to suggest that we could think about an ultimate context of violation still in terms of things as they are in themselves independent of human conceptualization, namely in, in terms of the noumenal world, um, but this uh, and this is this would be a way to understand another visual metaphor Kant uses, namely the focus imaginarius. But I leave this for the further discussion or maybe another talk. So um, then the full picture would look uh, something like this ultimately. And but let me briefly summarize what I've been arguing for today. So. Um, the contextualist interpretation conceives of ideas of reason primarily as deline delineating the contexts in which experience is first intelligible, namely a sufficiently determined and truth accessible cognition of objects. The contextualist interpretation does not have to postulate the real existence of noumenal beings for this purpose, in contrary to the noumenal interpretation. And so it denies a central assumption of noumenalism, namely that ideas can be assumed to refer even truthfully describe existing noumenal things. Uh, this can only be uh, play a, a role in projecting an ultimate context of evaluation. Moreover, the contextualist uh, interpretation does not ground the rules for the use of the understanding in false fictions, in contrary, uh, to the fictional interpretation, but it may be said to involve some sort of moderate fictionalism in the sense that the context of intelligibility are indeed products of the human mind. So finally, my hope is that this interpretation provides a more general interpretive framework that may be also applicable to Kant's moral practical ideas. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for that very clear and rich uh, talk. So as respondent, we're very happy to welcome Yanis Pesis. He is assistant professor of philosophy at the University of Crete. And I'll just mention a couple of publications. Uh, one is the concept of nature and Kant's metaphysical foundations of natural science from 2018. And the book from 2012, Kant's Transcendentale Dialectik zu ihrer systematischen Bedeutung. Okay, thank you very much for joining us, Yanis, and uh, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much for the introduction, Pavel. Thank you, Katerina, for this very stimulating talk, and thank you very much for the very stimulating text that you were so kind to send me in advance. I thank you all, 11 people, for the invitation. So I would say that indeed there is in Kant's scholarship an unfortunate dilemma between a nominalist and a fictionalist interpretation, as you call them, of Kant's ideas of reason. And I think you have a very good reason to, there's a very good reason for you to try to navigate a middle path. I would say on the one hand, Kant's position in the transcendental dialectic seems indeed to be that the objectification of the ideas itself is illusionary, not just the claim of knowledge. That should be a problem for a nominalist reading. On the other hand, 
Kant's position seems to be that ideas of reason are not mere fictions, arbitrary fictions, which are subsequently justified or legitimized because they turn out to be somehow useful, nevertheless. They are necessary products of reason, necessary for some logical reasons for Kant. And the principle of systematic unity is not merely a subjective logical demand. It has to be something stronger than that, somehow an objective transcendental principle. You cited Kant, it has objective but undetermined validity. That should be a problem for a fictionalist reading, or at least for an extreme fictionalist reading, as you called it. So I think indeed there is every reason to steer a middle path between the Scylla of nominalism and the Charybdis of fictionalism. I am very sympathetic to that. But I would say the tension in Kant's position that makes both extremes untenable is indeed captured by the central notion of the transcendental dialectic, the notion of necessary illusion, transcendental illusion. Schematically, I would say a nominalist reading does not do justice to the illusion part. A fictionalist reading does not do justice to the necessity part. In your, in your reading, I have the impression that you want to dispense with the illusion altogether. We do not have to objectify the ideas at all. We can take them to refer to contexts and not to objects of any kind, of any sort. But I think this position is difficult to maintain if this is indeed intended to be a Kant interpretation and not a Kant inspired systematic proposal that would be attractive, of course, in its own right. I mean, when Kant talks about the focus imaginarius in the appendix, he calls it an indispensable necessary illusion, unentbehrlich notwendige illusion. Or when he explains the regulative use of the ideas in the appendix and then in the end natürlich and dialectic, he says that we have to take the ideas of the first class as if the thing in self was a simple substance. You cited it as if it was a simple substance, so indeed an object. Or that we have to seek for more unity and more diversity in our knowledge of nature, as if the systematic unity of nature was grounded in an intelligent being and hence guaranteed. That is the idea of God there. So we have to take the ideas as if they refer to some nominal objects, as if the context, I would say, the systematic interdependence of appearances or of determinations was grounded in such an object, as if, of course, in the idea. We do not fall victims to that illusion yet. We maintain it and it is harmless. That would be my first point and my first question to you, how you deal with Kant's central notion of transcendental illusion, necessary and unavoidable illusion. And if I have understood your position correctly, how we can avoid for Kant the objectification of the ideas. How can take them that as context and not objects, not even as, as if objects. What about the as if that would be the first Point. I leave this difficulty aside and move on to your contextualist interpretation. You make a strong claim, I think, about the function of reason, the regulative use of the ideas as a condition or as a presupposition of objective cognition. The usual view would be that what reason contributes to cognition is a further step, an add-on to the accomplishments of the understanding that the understanding in its own right can deliver valid judgments, form empirical concepts, formulate empirical laws, and that it needs the guidance of reason in order to go a step further and seek the unity of those concepts, the coherence of those laws. You point out that the understanding needs the regulative guidance of reason in order to properly function in the first place. You cited Kant, reason prepares the field for the understanding, or that the coherence of the rules is the touchstone of truth for the rules, the touchstone of truth. The end there in a citation. So I think you certainly have a point there. I am sympathetic to that position, but how exactly should it be understood? You point out that the context of intelligibility or of semantical determination of a cognition has to be a system of concepts. I think this is most certainly Kant's view, but of which concepts? I would say, first of all, of pure concepts, the system of pure concepts of the understanding, the system of the category, and the system of transcendental principles of the understanding. That is the context for Kant in which an empirical 
appearance becomes intelligible to us. One can definitely argue, I think, that um, this systematic unity rests on reason, on the faculty of first principles and of systematic unity. I leave that aside because this aspect did not play a role in your talk. Although you had a citation that I think could refer also to these two systems a priori, but the regulative use of the ideas does not have to do with systems a priori, but with a goal of a systematic unity of empirical knowledge. So let me take an empirical judgment. I speak to your example, the, the rose is red, and ask whether and in what sense it presupposes a principle of reason. A Kantian would normally say what we need in order to go beyond our subjective perception and form that judgment is the category of substance and accident. We also need the empirical concepts rose and red. Do we also need a principle of thoroughgoing unity of empirical concepts, of flower concepts or of color concepts? And how thoroughgoing must this unity be? How far does it have to reach? I think this is exactly Kant's difficulty in the appendings to the dialectic. On the one hand, the principle cannot be a merely subjective logical demand. The systematic unity must have some fundamentum in re, but we cannot determine its limits a priori. The principle has to have objective yet undetermined validity, and we cannot attempt a transcendental deduction of it, Kant's position. That would be my second point or my second question to you. If a principle of reason is indeed a condition of concept formation or of judgment, then which exactly is this principle and what exactly is its status? I had the impression that we intended to be not logical, but real and yet not grounded in the object, in the possibility of the object. And that was not clear to me. My third and last point would be about the approximation of nominal reality, but you did not develop that point uh, much, so perhaps it would be, it wouldn't make no sense that I could leave it aside uh, what I had uh, somehow prepared. I don't know, if, does it make sense? You mentioned it very briefly, the, the interpretation of the focus imaginarius and the, um, and this um, idea that we approximate the uh, nominal reality as the ultimate context of evaluation. But okay, I think I, I leave it aside because you did not really develop it. And uh, if in the discussion it uh, makes sense, then I could perhaps go back to that. So maybe it again. could be. Maybe it could be relevant in my reply to your first point. So maybe. Okay, so I would say then, thank you. Yes, it is relevant for the first point because I think indeed as it is essential for Kant's position that there cannot be any such an approximation that we can indefinitely expand our knowledge in the realm of phenomena or penetrate into the inner of nature as he puts it in the Apiboli chapter without ever coming closer to some nonsensible ground. And I would say that for Kant's theory of ideas and for the transcendental dial dialectic, I would make the point that such goals as the totality of the conditions of appearance, sorts of the um, systematic unity of all determinations of thought are not just impossible to reach or too far away or too deeply hidden, but that we cannot even conceive these goals represent them in a consistent way. The case of the idea of, of the second class, of the world whole, those concepts are in itself antinomic. We use them regulatively and guide our research as if there were no ends of the series. But if we do try to conceive an actual infinity of conditions, or on the contrary, the second antinomy, some last constituent parts of matter as the end of inquiry, then we cannot avoid the antinomy. And I think that holds also for the thoroughgoing systematic hierarchy of general and particular concepts. For Kant, there cannot be any infamous species, but an actual infinity of intermediate concepts is also incomprehensible. 
So I think we cannot consistently think of an ideal end of our inquiries. As you had in your text, but you did not develop it here, as I said, of such an ideal end um, of inquiries in the realm of appearances. Therefore, I think that is indeed connected to my first point, the persistence of illusion, because I think Kant's position is that in the first and third class of ideas, but also for the dynamical antinomies, that we can consistently think of the unconditioned always as the ground of the totality of conditions outside the series of the sensible conditions. And therefore, I would say the focus imaginarius in the appendix cannot stand for such an ideal end of inquiry. It can only stand for a noumenal ground of a thoroughgoing unity, which ground is in principle beyond our visual field. But OK, that would lead us to the, to the discussion of this uh, visual metaphor that came up briefly at the end of your talk. So that's from me. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, uh, Yanis, for those um, comments and questions. Um, we have perhaps just a few minutes for a brief response, um, and then we can continue exploring these and other points together with, um, with, with the audience. Um, so, Katerina, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I'll try to make it very, very brief. Uh, thank you very much, Yanis, for coming up um, with these great points. And I think you put your finger exactly on the points that are yeah, that need to be further explored and that, that are controversial um, in some way or other. So if we, uh, there seems to be some, some agreement about how I kind of uh, structured uh, the, the landscape of views with nominalism and fictionalism and that we may wanna find some sort of alternative to this. Now, if you point out to me in your first question that you think that the one key notion in the transcendental deduction is still necessary illusion, the necessary unavoidable illusion. This seems to point for me towards the direction of a fictionalist view in some way or other. And so probably uh, what um, I'd like to hear is what exactly the as if is then doing the as in, in, in um, this view or in this way. Um, uh, you pointed out also in connection to your third point that we should think about it as still as everything what we are doing is ultimately grounded in something unconditioned in something nominal. And I did sneak in this idea of ultimately something is grounded in the unconditioned and the nominal at the very end of this talk. And um, I think there needs to be said much more. And so my brief answer to your first question would be that this necessary illusion uh, can still be accommodated as this focus imaginarius, as an, an imaginary representation of that noumenal world at which we ultimately aim at. But it does not play this semantic role on which I was focusing in this talk. So I think there still needs to be going on several things in our with our regulative use of ideas before uh, we we get to this um, this point but I mean I, I agree that there is maybe an, um, a question about priority is it that we first um, kind of come up with this illusion about the noumenal world we are aiming at and then from there go back and see how our rules for conceptualization and for cognition and determination should work. Um, so there's a there's probably a matter of, of priority, a question of priority there. In short, I don't want to get rid of the notion of an illusion, but I want to place it not in within the semantic function or the context of intelligibility. Now the second question was. Um, if I understood it correctly, what kind of status do principles of reason still have in particular as enabling conditions for concept formation in Kant? And whether I think they are logical or whether they are real or have a logical or a real use? Well, um, the principles of reason that are particularly relevant for concepts formation uh, what he calls the, the concepts of generalization, specification, and um, uh, similarity, so or affinity. So 
and precisely this quotation about the horizon was taken out of that concept where Kant discusses these three principles. And there Kant argues that they are not only logical subjective principles, but that they, or we necessarily have to, trend, uh, to presuppose transcendental principles of specification, generalization, and so on. And my way to spell out what a transcendental principle here is, is not to say it's it's a kind of principle that pertains to things in themselves or that has this object views, um, but it's to say, well, it is more a procedural principle of how we should go about in acquiring and forming our concepts, the concepts that we then use in our empirical judgments. So in a sense, I agree with you that the understanding in its own right can yield valid judgments, but what the understanding cannot yield is sufficient, it cannot sufficiently uh, semantically determine the content of its judgment, and it cannot yield uh, sufficient truth um, criterion, criteria of truth. So the judgments can that the understanding produces without the, the help of, the, of reason can certainly be valid, but we can only find out what exactly they mean and uh, in which whether they are true in light of the object if we plug in further principles of reason and make use of further principles of reason. And maybe I'll leave it here and yeah, open up for more general discussion. Thank you very much, Yanis. Okay, so the floor is now open. Go ahead and use the raise hand function if you um, have a question or comment on this or any other issue. So, Karen de Boer. Yeah. Yes, it was not my plan at all to go first, but maybe um, somebody has to do some it. Other, some other participants uh -huh. need a bit more time. Uh, yes, I thought all of this was very interesting. And I think my, um, my question is related to, um, to the point that was raised earlier on by, uh, by the two of you concerning this focus in Marginalius. And uh, I think there is, um, I think, uh, Katharina, that you suggested toward the end of your, of your paper that the, the image of a horizon uh, and a context and so on can easily be harmonized with the image of a focus, of a mm -hmm. focal point. And mm -hmm. I wasn't so sure about that. Yes, because I think you're, uh, you, I think you rightly want us to move away from uh, ideas as objects and to move us toward this, this, uh, this context of intelligibility and so on. I'm very sympathetic to this, but uh, I, 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 I like to think about this as, um, um, as when we um, are on a walk or on a trip and we, we need to have some, some uh, specific orientation points. Yeah, so if we would just be aware of, of a horizon Yes, imagine you're on a hill, you, you, you have this horizon within which a number of things appear to you. And I think that Christian Wolf also uses this image of someone standing on a hill and overlooking a valley or whatever. Uh, but, but so if you, if you just have this awareness of the, of the context of intelligibility, um, you have no incentive to go somewhere. Mm. Um, so for the, for, for, for for this, you need uh, a kind of point. Uh, and I think that Wolf uses the image of a tower that's somewhere over there. Yeah, so in order to direct yourself to something and to become active, you need this, this focus that, that's, that is in, 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 in Kant's case, not, not a real one, but, but an imaginary one. And, um, and I think that especially if the, or in the practical context that, that you did not discuss, of course, I think that for Kant, it's important to stress that, that the ideas must possess some kind of, um, of weight or sufficient uh, significance in order to actually um, 
uh, pull us toward uh, a certain end or, or, or behavior. And, um, and so I do not know if Kant can, can solve the tension, but um, I, I think I'm in agreement with Yanis that, um, that a context alone will not do. And, and so uh, that a certain degree of objectification uh, is necessary in order to actually um, um, make us go into a certain direction. That is to say, to actually uh, attempt to unify our representations in a theoretical context or to, um, to, to, to set out to achieve a certain goal. And so I'm not saying that the object, that the type of objectification is the one that you uh, attributed uh, to, to this um, nominal reading, but mm -hmm. I think there has to be something. And I think this, uh, I think that this is in accordance with uh, Janis' um, account as well. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, and I very much like your proposal and uh... Let me see whether I can accommodate it, um, at least to some degree, or whether I need to do much more work there. So um, I kind of see your point that if I stand on a hill, uh, a little uplifted, and I see this massive horizon, and then I have no idea, oh gosh, how, how do I cognize that? Like, where do I start to, to fill out this systematic unity I'm asked to fill out? And so it seems like once we focus on something, focus our intention on, a, on the particular ship that is shipping on the horizon or something like this, we become focused and we kind of focus our, our um, cognitive efforts towards this. So I certainly agree with this, um, with this idea. And now what, what do we do? So um, first of all, with this notion or by, by shifting the emphasis to the notion of horizon, I first of all wanted to kind of just clarify a sense in which I think ideas of reason give us boundary conditions for our cognitive endeavors. And so, for instance, whatever, like, at least in the theoretical case, whatever is going on within this horizon, I can make sense of by then picking out more specifically certain intuitions, for instance, about the ship on the horizon, and then apply more specifically um, empirical concept to this case. But I also agree with you that this is not enough to give us this kind of normative pull or this kind of, well, you, as you said, like sufficient significance for this whole enterprise for seeking knowledge. And there, I think you're absolutely right to say that there needs to be something on the horizon or beyond the horizon that pulls us in, in an objective or more objective way. And so in this sense, I agree. And, and in, to this extent, I agree even with the nominalist view. I, what pulls us objectively can in a way only be the world as it is in itself. Because ultimately what we wanna do with our cognition is kind of to come closer and approximate how things really are. So we want to make sure that if we, for instance, develop our sciences further, if we develop our physics further, further, we want to make sure that the systematic laws of physics we come up with really pick out kind of certain essential features or certain kind of lawful connections in the world and not just in the world as it appears to us probably. So I agree to some extent that that must be our ultimate goal, but um, my kind of, so in short, I want to, I would hope that my work on the horizon metaphor doesn't exclude that there can be many more things said about the focus imaginarius, even though I don't think we should understand it in this straightforward objective way or as a thing in itself. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Okay, I've got a couple of people on the list. Next up is Stephen Howard. Hello, um, thank you very much for this uh, really illuminating talk. Um, my questions on um, somewhat similar ground to those of um, Karen and 
and Janice um, posed it a little differently. Um, would you be willing to accept a, a distinction between um, ideas and transcendental ideas that's a little stronger than the one you make? And could you align this with the first and the second halves of the appendix? Because I noticed that your strategy with your uh, very interesting and convincing but very epistemic reading is basically to take um, what Kant says in the first half of the appendix where he's, his examples are um, pure earth and the fundamental force and so on, and apply these to the transcendental ideas. And um, I wonder, I mean, of course, transcendental ideas are still ideas, so it's not wrong, but could one say that transcendental ideas are doing something extra or even something slightly different? And here is when I come close to the earlier questions because it's at the start of the second half of the appendix where Kant um, introduces the idea of the object in the idea. And, and it's here, it's in this part that he says, reason cannot think this systematic unity without giving its idea an object. So the idea of the object then becomes much more significant when he's talking about specifically transcendental ideas. Um, so this would be my question, and maybe just something briefly to add in that same passage, um, Kant says that um, when we give our ideas an object in this way, um, it's to problematically posit a ground. And so perhaps in your response to Yanis's first question where you asked, what is the as if doing? Um, it's, and Kant says, it, it, then we uh, think of um, things in the world as if they have their ground in this being of reason. So this um, object in the idea. Uh, so my, my, what I would wonder is whether rather than sort of charting a course between the numeralism and the fictionalist I, interpretations, could one combine them? Um, and is this a passage where that would justify that? Yes, um, thank you very much uh, for this uh, question, which is also a very complex question and uh, continues what we've discussed before. So maybe first of all, to this uh, distinction between ideas and transcendental ideas, I was not going into this detail, but I certainly want to agree with you. There are just ideas and then there are transcendental ideas. Transcendental ideas are necessary ideas insofar as they come out of the internal inferential procedures of reason itself. And so he Kant gives us uh, already early in the transcendental dialectic these inferential uh, derivations, where like um, for like he he lines it up with the three syntheses according to the categories of relation, and then comes up with the idea of the soul, the world whole, and God as the three transcendental ideas. So in one sense, I'm inclined to say that they have a specific function. Um, because they seem to line out or to, to define the fundamental kinds of human experience. So in particular, the soul and the world whole as something like inner experience and outer experience as the most fundamental distinction we could draw about a kind of human experience. Later in the third critique, he adds idea of purposiveness uh, as this idea uh, of experience of living beings. Ideas such as pure earth, pure fire, and these ideas seem to have a much narrower function insofar as they are ideas that we need specifically to make progress in a specific scientific domain, for instance, or that we need for chemistry or for something like this, where we want to organize our cognitions within a more specific domain. I want to say there is a generic understanding of how ideas in all these different kinds work and how their regulative use look like, but I have been focusing specifically on those transcendental ideas because they seem to define fundamental kinds of experience. And with that, they seem to define fundamental natural kinds, I would almost like to say, like fundamental kinds of objects, namely mental objects or like a mind that we can experience through inner experience and a physical material object that we can experience through outer experience and so on and so on. But now what does it mean when he says, in order to use transcendental ideas, we need to posit a ground and that is we need to give the idea an object. How do I understand this? Um, so one way to cash this out is by giving an idea an object, 
it cannot mean that I just, or well, on one interpretation, it could mean that we create a being of reason and think that this is the real world. This would be maybe a very Hegelian way to think about it on some interpretation of Hegel. And I think this would be too much for Kant. So what on the Kantian picture, what he, I think is going on when we give an idea, give an object to an idea is we kind of, through means of the imagination, imagine such an idea in order to kind of derive certain normative rules for systematization. And I think there's more to be said about the analogy between schemata and systematizations there, which I didn't go into, but um, I don't think it can mean that we really point towards, well, that it, it's not positing in the sense of creating a reality out there. Yes. So, yeah, I hope I have replied at least to several aspects of your complex question. Thank you. Oh, yeah, thanks. Okay, our next question comes from Gilbert Plummer. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm wondering uh, how, <clears throat> or are you familiar with uh, Arthur Melnick on Kant? Pardon me, Arthur Melnick? Yes. 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 Yeah, I'm, I, I, uh, some of the, your, your view reminded me of his interpretation to some extent. And I was kind of wondering uh, how would you differentiate yourself, particularly with respect to uh, <clears throat> whether the idea for Kant of a thing in itself uh, is a metaphysical thesis or an epistemological thesis. Um, you know, the, the two interpretations, the main interpretations that you mentioned, the noumenal and the fictionalist seem to regard it as a, I would say regarded as a metaphysical thesis, uh, <clears throat> but the, the, the epistemological thesis that I'm referring to of Melnick, at least as I understand it, is that there's, there's no thing in itself way of knowing, not that there are, not really a question of whether there are a thing in itself, or not, but rather there's <clears throat> no thing in itself way of knowing. And I think that boils down from Melnick uh, to the idea that a purely descriptivist uh, view of the universe uh, is impossible. That is, <clears throat> you know, the knowledge from the point of view of eternity is impossible rather knowledge is always infused with uh, indexical or demonstrative knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much. This is, uh, this is very, a very interesting question. And um, so in, in one way, I want to say that in some sense, the metaphysical and the epistemological should not be completely separate, but go together in some way or other. And, but I want to agree that um, there's certainly no way of knowing in terms of a thing in itself. And uh, I also want to agree with this basic insight that all human cognition or human experience is indexical or demonstrative. So there is certainly from the human point of view, there is no full, complete and purely full and complete description of the universe. That's impossible from our point of view. I would think on the Kantian picture, it's still open, whether it's possible from a different point of view. I, I think Kant has some openness, but he also has no real commitment to that point of view. Um, only perhaps in the sense that uh, when, when we, once we come to the transcendental ideal uh, that corresponds to the idea of God as the ens realissimum, we um, have the principle of a thoroughgoing determination. And if we take that seriously, it seems to be leading to this idea that, that even in the theoretical case, perhaps, there should be a thoroughgoing determination of all reality that is available, not from the human point of view, but from some point of view. But what was my point or what is my major point with this contextualist interpretation is to say, 
uh, to spell out the way in which the human cognition and human experience is situated and limited, and that those ideas are necessary not because they give us a true and full description of a reality as it is, but they give us the sort of orientation we need in order to carry out our tasks and to come closer to, to get more systematic knowledge, for instance. So the, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the, the divine point of view would be what you called at one point a thing in itself, a uh, context, context of evaluation. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you, yeah. Okay, so we start a bit late, so we have time for one more question um, before we, which will come from Henny Blumma. Before we do that, perhaps I'll draw your attention to um, a bit of information in case anybody needs to leave that is posted in the chat. So there's a link to a conference that takes place online tomorrow and Saturday on this very topic, the ideas of reason. Um, the description and the lineups are in the link. And um, perhaps while I'm at it, I will also post, ah, uh, I see Karen has already posted as well, a link to the call for papers for the Live and Con conference, which will be partly online, partly face-to-face. -face, so everybody will have the option to come face-to-face -face, and it's on the reception of Kant between 1781 and 1804. So this early reception, uh, there's a more detailed description in that link there. Um, okay, so after this, we move to, we can continue um, this discussion informally. Um, and with this final question from Henny, we close the form, we will close the formal part of the session. So Henny, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Katarina, for your talk. Um, I, I have, in fact, two, two questions. I, I will start with one, which is um, about the distinction you make between an object and context. And I wonder if Kant's conception of an object is not a bit broader than you seem to uh, point to. So it seems that for Kant, an object is not just a chair or a table, but um, it is so rich, the concept of an object, that it includes to a certain extent already contextuality. And I think this is clear from the categories of relation where it's part of the concept of an object is that it must have causal relationships with other objects and that it must be embedded in a community of substances. And I, I, I would like so to, to specify a little bit my, my question, could you say perhaps something on the difference between the contextuality that is per definition, so to say, included in the concept of an object for Kant and the kind of context that you are pointing to. So that's that's the first point. And a second point is at, at a certain uh, moment you said that you think you think that science must go for must set for itself the goal to know the world as it is in itself. And I wonder if this is not some kind of pre-Kantian position, because um, if, um, if the world uh, as it is given to us is the world that is presented to us in space and time, it would mean that science would have to search for the truth for, about something that is not in space and time. And I wonder if it, this is not more the task of metaphysics than the task of science. So the, science uh, of physics, and I think you, you pointed to science in, in the actual uh, meaning of the world, where we associate it not so much with metaphysics, but with the exact sciences. And so I, I do think it's a bit problematic to say to the scientist, you have to, um, you have to give us cognition about the world as it is in itself. Because of the limitation of, of uh, the formal limitations of, of space and time, I think it wouldn't be possible. So that's my, my second hesitation, so to say, about your um, very interesting talk. Cool. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Henny, uh, for these two great questions. Um, let me say something about each of them in turn. And I start with your question about 
objecthood or uh, the notion of object in Kant and whether it does not already involve a certain kind of contextualism or context dependency in some way or other. I fully agree with you that within the concept of an object for Kant, in particular an object of experience, there's already included this idea that objects have causal relations, causal relations to other objects, they have certain communities with other objects. And so it seems that this is fully, fully covered already by the principles of the understanding. And I think the principles of the understanding give us only a formal uh, structure for causal relations, a formal structure for how objects can be in community with one another in space. But we still need to fill out these formal structures uh, and ask ourselves, what are the real causal relations? And of course, this depends on sensibility and this is, depends on being given sensible intuitions about these objects. But for some, so I, with this contextualist approach, I want to highlight that even the formal rules of the understanding plus sensibility is not enough to give us uh, a sufficient determination of, for instance, the causal uh, relations or the causal laws by which objects are governed. And even if we look at um, Kant's account of physics, for instance, and we look in the metaphysical foundations, at one point when he uh, derives the laws of mechanics, he introduces the idea of absolute space. So it seems to be that even there, an idea of reason seems to play a crucial role in delimiting or outlining the very context within which all these mechanical laws are operative at all, or what is the scope of these mechanical laws. And I think this is where I would say, I, I agree that at the level of the understanding, the understanding is already asking for a con context and reason is providing then this context by its ideas. And so the second point, um, about the goal of the scientists or, or of our science, um, to approach or to cognize, to know the world as it is in itself. I fully agree with you. If, if that would be my statement, that would not be entirely correct. So what I wanted to say, and let me make this more precise, is the following. I don't think the scientists can ever approximate or even ever achieve cognition of as the world is in itself. Cognition, by its very definition, is limited by the formal structures uh, and the formal limitations of space and time. But nonetheless, I think the ultimate goal of, of all knowledge, of all our inquiry, of all science is, is to move towards um, a description of the world that is in, in some sense independent of our, um, of, um, that is independent of say, of the specific conceptualization we choose, of the specific axiomatization of science, of, of geometry, of, of, for instance, uh, physics or something like this. But what is ultimately responsible that, for instance, a mechanical law that we find is actually, should be accepted as true, is that, that it's uh, what it describes is not kind of a projection of our mental structure onto the world, but the world itself uh, kind of, um, of the, um, the, the essential features of the world itself are responsible for whether a particular mechanical law we find is true or not, or is ultimately true or not. So in this sense, it's, it's the goal of science, but not in a sense that we can ever achieve knowledge of the world as such or cognition of the world as such. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, on that note, I'd like to bring the formal part of this session to a close and thank both of our speakers, Katarina Kraus and Yanis Pisis, as well as our audience members. Thank you, every thank everybody um, for the great questions. Thank you. So we're going to leave the camera open and we can discuss it formally for those that can sp stay. And otherwise, I look forward to seeing everybody here in this virtual space in February.